Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode we're going to be taking a look at a medieval mystery. Uh, it's the case of the Green Children of Woolpit. It may be something that you may have heard of, you may not have done, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the synopsis is basically um, in the 12th century England, would have been around about the time of King Stephen, so about 1135, uh, two children turned up in a village in South East England, Suffolk, and no one knew who they were, where they came from, and the strange thing is, is that they spoke a different language, they wore different clothes to everybody else, and the really strange thing was that they had a green tinge on their skin. Now you're probably listening to this story, and like myself, when I first heard about this, I thought, this sounds like a fairy tale, sounds like something that's made up in a children's book. But what kind of gives it a little bit of a little bit of clout is that it was actually recorded by two medieval writers at the time, one called Ralph of Cogshall, and the other was William of Newburgh. And it was actually recorded in the medieval book called The History of England, which came out in 1189, or otherwise known as the Alicarvum. Uh, so it kind of gives it a little bit of cloud. The fact that they've actually recorded this by two, I guess you could say, very well respected writers at the time. Um, so I don't think they would record just anything. So there would have been um, some some evidence there for them to think this this needs recording. We need we need to um, put this into a book somewhere to tell this story for future purposes. Um, so that's kind of what separates this from a, a fairy tale as such. But before I move on from this part of the, the story being recorded, and this will be important for later, and always, all the cases that I've looked at so far, I always think that it's, a lot of it is to do with what evidence have you got here. And bearing in mind this is an 800 year case if you look at it from that perspective. This is an old cold case, and you you've got the... You've pulled up this book and you've had a look at it and what I was looking at here was how did these how did the writers come across this evidence in which way was it told to them? And this is important now is that it was kind of like a hearsay type of evidence that they had to record it so that it wasn't direct from the two children. It was from eyewitnesses and accounts and from villagers. So with the green children of Woolpit, there was a lot of people that were talking about this. Um, so having a look at this, the the way I'm getting this is that the the way it was recorded was from third hand evidence, but it was still enough for them to say, "Hey, we we need to record this anyway." So just bear that in mind with this um, story. So, and the other thing is, which kind of makes this a little bit sketchy, is that they can only pinpoint it down to the 12th century somewhere uh, 1135 King Stephen or they're looking at possibly 1154 um, King Henry the second so they it's not an exact date but they're just saying it's around about this time so again it's I, I think this story happened but they're just it's difficult to be able to sort of pin it to a certain time and from a certain source so um Again, these are things to bear in mind when you look at the Green Children of Woolpit. Um, so let's have a look at some other stuff here. So let's um, talk about the village of Woolpit itself. It's uh, located in Suffolk, so it's uh, southeast England. Um, for any uh, of my overseas listeners, it's probably about, I would say, probably about 100 miles away from, from London, to give you an idea, on the east side. Um, Woolpit itself... Um, it would have been called Wolf Pit in the medieval times, and you know, we would have had wolves back then, and they would have dug pits to trap them. So that's where the name comes from. Um, it's between Bury St Ed Edmunds and Stowmarket, Market, and this is important as well to mention. Let's talk about the population of England. Uh, you would have had about 18,000 people in London, compared to today we've now got 10 million people. Um, population on the whole would have been 1.5 million compared to today's 68 million people just to give you an idea of the population status back then so in the village of Woolpit you probably would have looked at about 200 people 
living in that village at the time, maybe less than that. Um, and these would have been close-knit communities. And I don't think back then people would have like looked after each other. You, you wouldn't have necessarily ventured out. Probably never would have gone to the capitals um, or, or main towns. People were quite self-sufficient back then. So this is another thing to bear in mind. And when you think about this, you think... Um, even today, I was thinking about this because I, I used to live... Um, once upon a time, I used to live on the Isle of Wight. Um, and there were people who lived on that island that wouldn't even go to the mainland. And that's today. So you, if you can imagine in the 12th century England, 800 years ago, um, I would say that there's a very high percentage that people just, just stayed where they were to look after each other. Um, so that's the other thing to bear in mind here as well with this. So when you get two children that turn up and they've got green tinged skin and people wondering where they are, um, there was no forms of um, internet, news, travel. So the most people would venture out of that village would probably be a roughly about a mile, two mile radius if that. So people kept themselves, you know, looked after each other back then. Um, and I think that's something important to bear in mind for later on with this uh, case. So just think about that. So I'm again doing the old RJ McCready building block with this case to sort of try and get you from that sort of um, final conclusion. So let's talk about the actual case itself. So um, during this time, you had uh, two reapers in the field, um, so it was basically harvest time, uh, cutting back the uh, corn. They discovered two children, a girl and a boy, in a wolf pit. They appeared from this wolf pit. And they said that they had strange clothes, green skin and an unknown language. So they were taken back to um, the village um, and they were taken to the... Uh, knight of that village which was uh, Richard de Calm and he took them in he tried to look after them he um, tried to feed them some bread and some meals but they, they refused everything except uh, green beans believe it or not that's the only thing that they would eat um, the older sister um, adapted to this uh, community life and she started to eat um, other foods but unfortunately um, the brother, he started to become sick and eventually he died and he passed away. But then over the time, sister grew up and um, she started to lose the green tinge on her skin and she eventually began to speak English and as she got older she recounted the story of where she came from. And she basically said that she came from a land where there were uh, there was a community living underground in caverns and they all had green skin but it was they didn't have direct sunlight they had like a twilight and one day her and her brother wandered off and they got lost and they crossed the cavern and they were drawn to the sound of bells and they made their way out to uh, um, the entrance of a cave where they saw sunlight and they emerged from the cave to be mystified by the the sunlight, the impact of the sun, and they couldn't find their way back. And then this is where they were found by the reapers. So this is where the story connects. But she had a name for this land. She called it Saint Martin's Land. And she also said that there was a great river that divided it from the land of the of the light. So you know, it's yeah. You know, what do you say about this uh, story? Obviously, over time, um, people have speculated with this story because um, some people have said it's you know they come from another dimension. Could there be a community of people living underground that we don't know about? Um, of course, people have thrown in the theories of aliens. Of course, they have. You know, because. Uh, you know, why wouldn't you? <laughs> um, so she gave this account and then as she got older, she um, she, she got baptised within the community. Um, she actually got married uh, to a diplomat called Richard Barr. And some people think that this was a diplomat that was connected to uh, King Henry II because that's the only um, 
bar that people can sort of connect this this name to at that time. Um, she took the name as Agnes Bar, and then from there onwards, I've had a look at this, and I can't really find any other um, accounts of Agnes Bar or the timeline. So it's a good chance that someone out there could be related to her, you know, in a family um, line. But there's no other information about that. So all we've got is the villager story that was written down by scholars of the village um, and that uh, the brother passed away unfortunately and the little, little girl grew up within the community and she adapted and she got married so um, from there onwards you've, you've now just got this uh, folklore tale um, but as I said but what divides this between other folklore tales is that you've actually got a little bit of um, recorded evidence here from from people's accounts so let's have a look at what it possibly could be um, so what I've mentioned here is that um, you've got to get it in your mind I think with this with this story is the actual you've got to put your mind into the actual community of people at the time um, so as I said people would have been living in um, forest villages with small communities and very rarely would people be venturing out. So you probably wouldn't know an awful lot about what's going on um, in the world. You'd just be a very, you know, hence the word, close-knit close, close -knit community. So I think what, what people are saying here, what I've had a look at here is, um, which kind of does make sense, is you would have had Flemish immigrants at that time in other villages. So this would have been the Dutch. Um... And back then, the Dutch would have been like the, the traders uh, to England from Belgium. And there's a little bit of fact here. When, when we did have the plague in England, it was only the Dutch that basically saved us because they were the only ones that would travel up the River Thames to um, deliver the um, cargo as such from, from the ships. And that's why they've, that's where you hear the word Dutch courage. Um, but along the way you would have had um, like shipwrecks so people would have had to have um, created like a community so that would make sense on the southeast of England with Belgium you, that's where the um, um, ship shipping channels would be so you could have had like a shipwreck and a community of people who were settling just to try and sort of survive I suppose you could say and I think what's happened here that this kind of would make sense for this time where you probably had a community of Flemish people um, living on the southeast coast or round about round about that area of England which would be close to Walpit and I think what you've got here is a case of two children going missing from that community and when they when um, the older sister said that she came from a land of St. Martin's across the way from Walpit. So, two miles away from um, Walpit, or as it's known today, it's called Sperry St. Edmunds, you have Furnham St. Martin's. So, you've actually got a place called St. Martin's, and between that, you have a river mark that runs across it. So you've got the river that the girl recounts and the St. Martin's land. And then in Furnham St. Martin's, no, sorry, in Bury St. Edmunds, uh, there is a church, a medieval church that's from that time, which regularly would have played the bells or rung the bells. And the other thing that you've got in Furnham St. Martin's, and this really does sort of firm this up a bit, is you actually had um, flint mines so there's an awful lot of underground caverns in that area so I think what it is if you you've got a community of Flemish um, who have settled in this area and what's a better what's better place to to live is in in a in a mine for for shelter so I think you've got a community that's lived under living underground set up a community um, and then with the two children they may have been lacking in because they're living underground sunlight um, some people say that it, it could have been um, arsenic poisoning which they were suffering which does make sense because uh, back in these times arsenic would have been used um, for like green dye so if you've got that in your skin it, that's where you could get the uh, green tinge 
And then it would also make sense for the reason why the, the young lad passed away, because he was probably suffering from arsenic poisoning. Um, but for some reason, the girl was obviously repellent to it in some ways. She managed to, to, to get through that. So the facts of this case kind of come together when you look at it. Um, and obviously their, their language and their clothes, so they probably would have had different clothes um, coming from Belgium. They would have had a different type of fashion back then, so that would have been um, alien to the community in this country. And obviously their language, they would have spoken Dutch. Um, again, you know, for a close-knit community. E even today, I th as I said, you know, if... If you had a if you had a close knit community somewhere, like I said, you know, on the Isle of Wight, and uh, some people turned up from Belgium initially, you may not understand what they're saying. So you you go back eight hundred years ago. Um, I think today, obviously, as I said, we we have the luxury of internet, social media, and we we know a lot about what's going on in the world today. So if you met someone from um, other parts of Europe or other parts of the world, you probably go, yeah, that sounds sounds like they're from South America or they're from Africa or um, from Australia or you know India or something like that. But back in those these times, 800 years ago, medieval times, people would go, go I have no idea. I've, I've, I've never even never never even heard of this language. So you and then what's really thrown this off for these people in this community is the green skin, you know. Yeah. <laughs> What the hell's going on there with that? But when you look at it today, it, I think this case is, I would say, is solved. I think it does have an explanation to it. Um, so if I was to put my money on the table, I would say that you had a Dutch community living a couple of miles underground for a shelter um, from Bury St. Edmund's Wall Pit. And you've got a case of two children who are unfortunately suffering from a type of um, dietary issue, who have wandered off from this community. They've gone across a river. They possibly could have come out from a cave from the old flint mines and then couldn't find their way back. And they speak a different language. They're in a different country. Uh, they're wearing different clothes. And now they've stumbled upon this community. And everybody's like going, well, where have these two children come from? So it is a case of two two children that have lost their way. And they don't know how to get back home. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, you know, I think this still happens today. You know, I think there's anybody listening to this, right? If you, let's just say you work somewhere in a workplace and something happens... And someone comes in and tells you a story about somebody else. That story will be ramped up to the 10 by the time it gets to the 10th or 11th person. Then when you actually get back to the truth, you find out that it's not as ramped up as it is. So um, I think you've also got the community of, uh, you know, they, they call it like Chinese whispers. And back then you could imagine people say, oh, those two kids, they've got green skin. You know, they speak a different language, they've got strange clothes, and then things just get ramped right up. And I think that's what, what's happened in this case, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of medieval gossip, you know. Um, but it, it is a sad story at the same time, because you've got two children who are lost, and the brother passed away, unfortunately. It must have been so upsetting for the girl um, as well, back in, in that time. Um and then obviously the case has become popular amongst the community. So then you've got the two scholars that thought, well, we need to record this. Um, and then through the years, um, you then have all this, you know, the speculation about them coming from a different dimension, green skin, you know, aliens and all that sort of stuff, which makes it, you know, a, a mystery, um, which is always going to, come to several different outcomes of course it is because unless you was there at the time I mean we've only got um, s s sketchy evidence to, to go by so even though I've come to that conclusion that's what I think it is you know I think it, they're from a Dutch community um, that was settling down because of maybe a shipwreck or something like that um, then of course you know put that card on the table could they have come from a, a, a 
an underground cabin where there's a community living underground right now that we don't know about. Well, you know, <laughs> you can put that card on the table as well. So, but it's it's a you know it's a fun story. It's folklore. Um, we, I do love these old folklore stories as well. You know, I think it's what probably started off all the fairy tales and stories and stuff like that. Um, but what I will say is. Um, this isn't the only time that we've we've had stories like this, which is interesting. Even though I've come to a type of conclusion with this, what is interesting is the actual colour green. I was thinking about this um, before recording the show. Actually, I was thinking how much the colour green is associated to to folklore. So when you really think about it, and this one really opens your mind, is you've got the green man, you know, from the sort of old sort of pagan. Uh, rituals of of England or the Celtic community. Um, you've got the Green Knight. You've got Green Goblins. You've got Green Fairies. You've got the story of Jack of the Green. Um, you've also got green fields, green vegetables. Um, I can literally go on and on with this. I think uh, you go a little bit green when you feel ill. Uh, they say someone's a bit green if they're new new to something. Um, you've also got the green emblem for the, was it the green cross for like paramedics and medicine, which is interesting because of the, uh, the green tinge of skin on, on these children. Um, the Johnny Green Giant, I suppose. <laughs> if anybody remembers that old sweet corn advert, chat that one in there. Um, so yeah, it, it gets you thinking. The other thing is as well, there is a case, so I need to mention this as well before I wrap up the show. There is a certified medical case today called chlorosis, where people suffer with a green tinge on their skin. I think it's like a sort of medical uh, condition where they're lacking in the vitamins or something like that. So it is. So that is another um, stated case as well which is, you know, something to mention. And, you know, it's not only just uh, green. I think there are people... I've heard a case where someone's eaten nothing but carrots and orange juice uh, to the point where their skin's gone orange. So the, these cases do happen as well, not only with a green tinge, but with, a, like, a orange tinge as well. So, um, so yeah, so there you go. That is the Green Children of Woolpit. Um, I can see where you can have all the sort of... Um, folklore, speculation, they come from the subterranean world. Um, but I think I, I think the conclusion I've come to here today is kind of makes it plausible. But at the same time, it, may, it is a great story. And um, I think one day I will be, uh, venture up to Walpit, up in Suffolk, to go and visit this uh, place and see, see what's going on up there. So um, there you go, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, Let's do some uh, admin for the show before I wrap it up. So I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Um, so please go and check out all the other shows on there, including my movie review show, which is called Bite Size Cinema Podcast, where um, I've just done The Evil Dead 2 with um, uh, a guest, uh, Mark Ball. We had a, a ton of fun with that episode. And I've got um, a film from 2007 coming up called Hot Rod. Uh, which is a comedy movie, and I'll be doing that with uh, Gary Hill, a uh, fellow podcaster. Um, and I'll be, uh, I haven't decided what I'm going to be doing next for the episode, but I will pick something, something maybe unusual or something that we all know about. I'll, I'll think about that. Um, you can find the Mystery Vault podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, and several other players on the internet. If you put in bite size, um, not bite size, the Mystery Vault podcast. It will take you to somewhere where you can listen to the show. Also got a Facebook page where I'm most active, so uh, post anything on there, any any mysteries you want me to have a look at, I'll be happy to take a look for you. Anything strange and um, mysterious and unexplained. Um, so yes, that's it guys. So as always, keep it mysterious, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. here in this room is a well.
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.